400 yard passers, plural. Defensive touchdowns, plural, plural. Flags, plural, plural, plural. And a game that was the 13 year old Andy Reid compared to others. <laughs> Here's our crew. Let's go around the horn. Big Andy Reid. <laughs> Last night as the Super Bowl, I'm not talking about as a preview. I'm saying we could all agree to cancel the rest of the season because can we possibly do better than that? Or maybe best of three? Who knows? It broke records. It broke the idea of defense, but still somehow had some incredible defensive plays. It broke Scorigami. Scorigami! They never had a 50-50 <laughs> scenario. Gorlami. Mina Kives, we're going to start with you. What did we witness? A Super Bowl preview, an all-time great game, a glimpse of the league's present and future, or just a wild night in Los Angeles? <laughs> we witnessed an evolution in football. Okay. That's not overstating it, because the best teams in the NFL right now, and those were two of the three best teams, the other being the Saints, have ridiculous offenses and average or worse defenses. However, those defenses each have a couple playmakers, Aaron Donald, D. Ford, who can make game-breaking plays, and that ended up being the difference in this game. It was Mahomes turning the ball over more than Goff as a result of those plays because those offenses were neck and neck the entire okay, way. Okay, so what we witnessed was an evolution and a revolution. Speaking of, Woody Page, you're with us. What did you witness last night? I think evolution takes longer than one night. I think it was an extraordinary, entertaining event. I'm glad they moved it from Mexico City because I don't think we would have seen on that surface down there the same type of game. I do think that we realize now that it's totally an offensive game and you better have a young offensive coach and a great young quarterback. And I think that in the situation that we saw last night that that was – the most special game that I've seen in years and years and years other than one in New England earlier this year between Kansas City and New England. Tim Galishaw. You know, I think we did see the future that the NFL wants. As Mina pointed out, there's only three teams that can really play this game. Uh, everybody else is a little more limited offensively or they have a little better defense. But they've legislated defense uh, out of the game uh, to the point that the Chiefs got an early targeting call on a play where there was, should have been no targeting. They don't, they don't want you to hit receivers going over the middle. They want to let them catch passes. But it was a heavyweight fight that lived up to the hype. I mean, this is the game we wanted, and, and it was terrific. Tim, uh, I saw you on Twitter. You said you had a witness one of the best previous games of all time, or at least going into a game. It was the 10-1 and Niners and the 10-1 and Giants. Just remind us how that game ended. 7-3, 49ers, Montana and Sims <laughs> combined for 305 yeah. yards passing. That's evolution, Holmes. Another point for me to Cobbs. Kevin Blackestone, what did you witness last night? Well, this was the NFL, the National Fun League. This was exactly what it was. And I know we want to dissect this game like a Thanksgiving turkey into all its bits and pieces. But you know what? One night, I just wanted to enjoy a football game. And as Tim said, this lived, be, this lived up and beyond our expectations. It was up and down the field. It was like a flag football game. It was fun mm -hmm. to watch. Every, t every time you thought someone had the upper hand, the other team came back. There were incredible plays. You even had the best defensive player in the game in this offensive right, right. onslaught make a big play in Aaron Donald. So I just enjoyed it. But you called it flag football, and that's what some people will say is a negative mark against this game. Does everybody agree this was good football, or is anybody going to say and politely ask those 105 points to get off their lawn? Uh, Mita Kimes, you? I think it was fun football. I think it was good offense. I don't think it was good defense. And we're talking about two defenses that each gave up over 400 yards, two quarterbacks that put up passer ratings over 117. There were very good defensive players on each side of the ball, but it was not a team effort on defense. All right, so you're team. kind of hitting the pause button then. Woody Page, how about you? It was not good football. It was great football. What do we want to see? We want to see great players making big plays when you have a thousand yards offense and you have that many points over a hundred you telling me that uh, you'd rather have a game that's three to nothing in fact I was hoping it go into overtime and it ended up as a tie game that would have been an incredible tie if it worked out that way as it was at halftime I think it was good football that became great football because of the defensive 
uh, contributions. Seven turnovers and three of them directly yeah. touchdowns. I mean, we see in college football, especially in the Big 12, but elsewhere, uh, 54, 51 type games all the time. But it's all offense where the defense can't do anything. At least the defense was making big plays. KB, who impressed you most? You know, for me, it was Jared Goff. I mean, here's a guy who came into this game and really kept his ledger pretty clean with the exception of, of one play. Uh, no interceptions, um, throwing the ball as accurately as anybody I've really paid attention to in football recently. Um, a guy who, you know, we talked about getting on the field when he was a rookie, finally got out there. We had some questions about him, and now you see him perform at this level. He's a top five quarterback top in five this quarterback. league right now. Jared Goff has and, made the yeah, leap to top five for you. Absolutely, and he does not have the offensive weapons that Patrick Mahomes has, I don't think. Nina Kimes, He's made those I saw guys your face better. when Blackstone said top five. What do you say to that for Jared Goff? Uh, I, it's Todd Gurley, not an offensive weapon. I, that would confuse me. I, it listen, wasn't last I, night. I was impressed by Goff. I was impressed by um, I was impressed by Mahomes as well, but to me the the difference in this game was Aaron Donald, right? Because these offenses, like I said, they were punching back and forth, but one defense stepped up. One defense applied a little bit more pressure in key moments, and Donald honestly has a case for MVP, perhaps a bigger case than Todd Gurley at this point. Tim Kalisha? Hmm. I think I would say Tyreek Hill because one minute Chiefs fans are cursing him for fielding a punt at the one, and the next minute he is so wide open to score a touchdown, and, uh, you know, I, I guarantee you NFL defensive players watching this game are just going, how are you supposed to deal with this guy? Did Mahomes help or hurt his case for MVP? Mina, you know, Woody, you want to get some takes here? I'd like to take that. I think he helped his case. People go say, oh, five turnovers, six touchdowns, but, you know, once uh, on the final touchdown uh, interception, his arm was hit. Uh, he couldn't see Donald coming from the other side on one of the others. But when a guy just continues to play as he's doing, he's not only a top five, but he's number one this season and the heading guy for, I think, MVP. And he just continues to impress you more every week. So I don't think that effort last night. You're shaking your head no again to something one of your colleagues is saying. Please go ahead. He is phenomenal. He's absolutely in the top two, but he lost a little bit of ground to Drew Brees because those interceptions, how many interceptions has Drew Brees thrown this, this entire season? One. One. Drew Brees, by the way, who beat the Rams. I don't think you can say in any way that he made up ground against TC? him last night. I think actually the thing that hurt him, the only thing that hurt him was the loss because it's going to come down to that, and, and I don't know when the Saints are going to lose again. I think the f ridiculous six touchdowns and 400 yards offset all the turnovers. Kevin Blackstone, can I ask you about the defenses? I know, I know we focused on Aaron Donald. Did sure. you get enough defense in this game, or would you say the defenses were exposed despite the big plays? You know what? Um, I think they were exposed by the big chunk plays that you had last night. But if I'm looking at both teams and I'm going to measure them off the defense, we know the offenses are incredible. I've got to lean towards the Rams. I mean, once again, they've got the best defensive player in the NFL, and he showed up last night in a huge way. Uh, they've also got a guy sitting out in Tlaib who can help them out down the line, and they create turnovers. That was not um, abnormal for them to do what they did last because night. Because I guess what I'm teams. wondering is, is you are the Saints, Mina Kimes, you're Drew Brees, or you're the Patriots, or you're the Steelers, you're at home watching this game, you're seeing these teams doing what they do offensively, and you're in awe, of course, but then you're looking at their defenses, and you think, well, they've been exposed a little bit here. Yeah, I mean, look, if you don't have an offense that can keep up with these teams, you're not going to compete with them. I think the Saints do. On defense, there are really great defenses in the NFL right now, but they don't have offenses that can keep up. I'm thinking of Chicago. So you got to make plays, you got to get turnovers, you got to get pressure, and pray that you can hold them to field But goals. my question is, Woody Page, um, was there a blueprint at all in this game? Um, maybe how to get to the Rams defense, how to get to the Chiefs defense by some of those other teams like New Orleans, New England, Pittsburgh, Houston. Go ahead, Woody. No, I don't think there was any blueprint. When you got that many exceptional players on offense, you are watching that game last night frightened. There are at least 17, 18 teams in the league that would love to have either one of those young quarterbacks for the next 10, 12 years. So I think the blueprint is that you've got to maintain possession of the football. You can't let them control the time and control the ball offensively. Mm -hmm. Kalisha? Uh, the, bl the blueprint is if you can't get an Aaron Donald, you better find a way to get pressure because secondaries can't cover these receivers uh, in, in this league right now. 
And, and I thought that was the difference. Mahomes had more pressure around him more of the game than and Goff. And Blackstone. And, and it doesn't matter whether or not you can, whether or not you can pressure the, the quarterback. The question is whether or not you can produce enough points to stay in this track meet because that is what these offenses have turned, have turned into. And remember, the NFL all across the league right now is scoring more points than they've ever scored before. This is a trend that we've seen happening uh, coming into the league from college. That's why RPOs I think and all Mead that. was calling it, uh, you know, not proof of evolution, not the start of evolution, but then here we are at the top of the offensive mountain. Uh, we still that with the scoregami. There never been a game with this point total before in the history. Uh, real quick, after the horn now, I know, but all-star repping crews, um, love them or leave them, Nina? <laughs> Leave them because the less attention on the refs, the better. And they drew attention to them before the game even began. It was a bad Wait. idea. Leave them. Forget about all the penalties. Think about all the officiating conferences last night. On every play, it looked like a board of right, directors they had meeting work of the kind of all-star officials. Yeah, I don't even like it for the Super Bowl. I think you should always just take your best crew, whoever grades out the best, and use those. those uh, this crew is grading out pretty well right now. Although we're talking about evolution, you're talking about uh, who's coaching these teams. And what you had said, you got to find a young offensive coach. One of these coaches last night was Andy Reid. He's not young. He's very offensive. We saw him when he was young, and he was so much bigger than every 13-year-old. But he's still, he's still, he had three timeouts at the end of that game yesterday during that two-minute drill. We're taking a break here. Buy or sell on the other side. I mean, he's evolving a little bit, wouldn't you say? It's buy or sell, and we'll start with the Washington Wizards. It appears the Wizards at 5-11 and 11 are a mess. Maybe, Kevin, you need to earmuff yourself here. Um, verbal barrage is how it's been described. John Wall on Scott Brooks in practice. And then everybody got in on it. Bradley Beal versus Ernie Grunfeld, the GM. Bradley Beal versus Austin Rivers. John Wall versus Jeff Green. Kelly Oubre versus Scott Brooks. Now the report is that the Wizards wouldn't be against trading Wall and Beal and blowing up the whole thing. Speaking of blowing up the whole thing, here's Dwight Howard practicing free throws and arena workers yelling, Brick, KB, this is your account. What's the first Thanks. step here in fixing this team? Well, you, you can't fix it. Uh, it is broken. Okay. I think they hit their high water mark a few years ago when they had 49 wins, Scott Brooks' first year. Uh, but you know what's curious here? Ted Leonsis has owned the Washington Capitals forever. He was not afraid to make a general manager move with that team despite some of his, his playoff success. But for whatever reasons, he's never made that move with these Wizards since taking control. And it may be time for the third longest tenured GM in the NBA and Ernie Grunfield to go the other way and let somebody else come in and All right, so buy or sell, blow up the team. You say blow up the team, and the first move would be a new GM. Mina Kimes, how does that sound to you? Yeah, when you got a long list of spats and Dwight's not even involved in any of them, you've got a problem. Blow it up and buckle up because it's going to be a multi-year rebuilding project. It's going to be very difficult for them to move John Wall with that looming Supermax. KB's absolutely right. This starts with the front office that got them in this position to begin with. I know they extended Grunfeld, but they've got to make a move. Rip off Woody the Woody Page. If I'm the general manager of the Lizards, I mean Wizards, I trade John Wall for anything. Just give him away. You don't want to have this contract on your team for the next five years. And I'd keep Bill, I'd get rid of Porter, and then I would resign because I don't deserve to be there. <laughs> All right, but you, th you think Wall is tradable with that Supermax contract looming? You think there's a team? I mean, you're going to have to eat a lot of that? I mean, it's Kalashaw. You know the cat better than anybody here. <laughs> oh, yeah, I love it. Uh, I'm going to sell blowing up the team. I'm going to agree with Woody. Uh, that trading John Wall is the thing to do. And yes, it's going to be very hard. There's always somebody out there who has other problems they want to get rid of. We've seen teams make incredible deals. Move him and see what that does to the chemistry. All right, all right. I mean, it feels like there's always a contract. You're like, well, that's not tradable. And then, yes, there's always a taker. Blake Griffin in Detroit last year was an example. We'll move on. Buy or sell two, Kemba Walker. Kemba Walker. He's having a moment, 103 points over the last two games. Didn't get a win with 60. Nothing would stop him last night versus Boston. This is his shed, apparently. Okay, good to know. Leading scorer in the NBA, MVP chance at the high for the eight-seed Hornets. Mina, can a guy like Kemba, playing for a team like the Hornets, the way he's playing right now, ever win an MVP? 
Should he? Absolutely. Also leads the league in clutch points. But will he? Probably not. Based on precedent, Westbrook was an aberration with those 47 wins. Usually goes to the best player on a great team. Charlotte's not even a good team. 40 page? No, it's not happening. Uh, tell me, are the Hornets in the national consciousness? I don't think so. Nobody's paying attention except when he scored 60 points. What they need to do is to get him a second man. Then he'll have a chance if there's an inside guy that would really help him. Maybe the Hornets should be in your conscience, Woody Page. This is the job we have in front of us to talk about this team. You can't blame them for the fact that you're not talking about them. Tim Kalisha, how about you? This isn't baseball where you can win MVPs and Cy Youngs on really bad teams. It's hard to do in the NBA, and they're not a really bad team, but they're not good enough that him even averaging 30 points like he's going to do, that's not going to be enough. Yeah, I mean, he can't do it, but let's give him some credit. I mean, this guy is really hitting his stride right now. He's been a 20-point-per-game scorer in this league before, been on an all-star team, so uh, Kimba Walker can ball. Fire sell three, the retirement of Adrian Beltre, all right? Where he ranks all-time at third base and where he ranks all-time of people who you can't touch their head. Timmy, you've covered him for the last eight years. Who is Adrian Beltre and what's his legacy? Well, it feels like the end of an era around here, and I know some of you are saying, what kind of era was that? But they did go to two World Series. Mm-hmm. Beltre yeah. played in the second one. He, he was the signee when they couldn't sign Cliff Lee. One of the best leaders in any sport uh, that I've ever seen. And the combination of power, over 3,000 hits, gold gloves, uh, one of the top three or four third basemen ever. Top three or four third basemen ever, says Callis Shaw. Blackstone? Well, absolutely he's that, but think about it. There's no third baseman that's put together those type, those number of hits and those number of home runs in the history of baseball. We're talking about a top five guy here in terms of offensive contribution to go along with five gold gloves. Baseball is just so weird that we overlook greatness in a guy like Beltre. Mina Kimes? Yes, surefire first ballot Hall of Famer, top three third baseman. For me, his legacy is a guy who improved, a guy who got better in his 30s, which is remarkable given how good he started defensively and how amazing he ended up as a hitter. Woody Page. Greatest third baseman of all time. If you look at the war, guys, which wasn't even around when he came into the league, the Dodgers signed him when he was 15. There's no third baseman that's even close in terms of war when you add all the other statistics and those defensive qualities that he had. He got better at the end than he was in the beginning. I think he's third in war among third basemen, not first. I mean, Mike Schmidt, I I thought, was was unanimous. He's going to be the best. Third baseman of all time from this panel, but what do you don't agree with that? The other is uh, George Brett, Chipper Jones. I mean, was he better than Chipper Jones? They almost played in the same era. Jones had an MVP. The question is, is Beltre ever Beltre. the best in the game at his position, but also just the best in the game? I don't think that's true like it was for Schmidt. And Woody Page has done as well. We have Amina Kimes, Kevin Blackstone showdown. Last showdown of the week, guys, and then it's uh, Turkey Day. So let's see who's hungry in showdown next. Stick around. Last showdown of the week, and it's Mita Kimes and Kevin Blackstone. Best of luck. Showdown one. Some odd things happening in college football. Arkansas suspending two players for flirting with Mississippi State's spirit team before Saturday's game. The Big 12 reprimanding Texas's Brick and Hager for saying Oklahoma still sucks after Texas beat Iowa State. And Kansas's new rule, no live mascots on the field. Bebo's not making the trip. Mina Kimes, what are you for? What are you against? What are you riding for? Listen, the show's called Around the Horn, so I feel like I got to defend Bevo's honor and the honor of live mascots everywhere. They're the best part of college I'm, I'm football. I'm against the Let two Razorback here. players being, being turned in for flirting or whatever they were doing before a game by a former Razorback player who is now working as a TV reporter. Is that right? I, I didn't know that piece of information yeah. here. You'll get a point. Yeah, so will we Mina for around the horn. We'll move on. Carey Price is saved to save regulation. It was so good, Ovechkin had to applaud it. Came in the final seconds. In overtime, Canadians lost, though. So, does that make it less applause-worthy, KB? No, it's still applause-worthy. You saw the great eight give him one of these. Great play. From, a, from one great player to another great player. Absolutely. Great play, but I love the applause because when you rewatch it, you can tell Ovechkin knew he was going to win. That's why he wanted to give him credit for it. Is that right? Are, are you going to applaud here, Blackstone's answer, because you know you're going to win, Mita Kimes? I don't know. <laughs> Point Stone, showdown three. Jimmy Butler's hug with Allen Iverson last night. Look at it. It lasted 20 seconds. So long they had to take a break in the middle. Went back in for more after. 
Mina, just a hug or something more? Well, the question is, is he going to stay in Philly? And I think you should ask AI. Because of the height differential, he was listening to Jimmy Butler's heart. Uh. We're talking <laughs> hug. We're not talking about the game that was to be played. We're talking about a hug. Two hugs. Come on, uh, man. Okay. Right. Okay. I'll give you a point, Blackstone. Uh, if you were to give me a remix of that, I think I would have given you more points. But eight-inch height differential so you can listen to his heart <laughs> made of kinds. Yeah. You're in FaceTime. Oh, man, so this is the last show before Thanksgiving, so I'd like to list a few of the football things I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for these high-octane offenses, for coaches who call play action on first down and go for it for, on fourth. I'm thankful for Khalil Mack and Aaron Donald, and I'm thankful for everyone who works on this show and watches it. We appreciate you all. There it is. Last show of the week. Woody, any tips for Thanksgiving for us right now? No can. Cranberry. Oh, oh, you're 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 anti canned cranberry. I know Plasky's for it. I think I think Cal for it. it. Have Plasky a wonderful Thanksgiving, you. everybody. We'll be back on the other side Monday. Oh, come on. I'm thankful for this camera lens.